Good evening, I'm Dennis Ward. Welcome to APTN National News. The First Nations Child and Family Caring Society is once again before the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in Ottawa this week. This time the organization is taking the federal government to task for failing to process Jordan's principles claims in a timely manner. APTN's Fraser Needham has more. Former Associate Deputy Minister for Indigenous Services Valerie Gideon was before the tribunal on Tuesday. She said one thing that might help the government meet the backlog of Jordan's principal requests is increasing First Nations' capacity to assist in processing claims. I think the extent to which First Nations could participate uh, in the determination of requests is something that would, first of all, alleviate, obviously, the volume of requests that would come to the federal government, but it would also be more aligned in the pathway to self-determination. Jordan's principal says First Nations kids are supposed to be able to receive health, social, and educational supports when they need them, regardless of whether they live within a federal, provincial, or territorial jurisdiction. First Nations First Nations Family and Caring Society says Ottawa continues to fail to meet the standard and First Nations children are dying because of it. Documents discussed at the hearing show that government is failing to process requests on time in about 35% of cases. We want Canada to uh, abide by its legal orders so that kids stop being hurt and kids uh, don't die unnecessarily. I mean, one of the things we're hearing a lot about in that room today is a lot of procedural stuff for the government, how these are operational concerns to the government. What we're not hearing is what's happening at the ground for kids. For her part, Tribunal Adjudicator so, uh, Sophie Marshallton told the hearing the status quo clearly isn't working and it is incumbent upon all parties to do better. Surely there's a better way moving forward and I will ask, I personally will ask every single party to dream, to dream the best scenario that they've ever dreamed of and to review the their requested orders, thinking we need solutions now and we also need solutions in the long term. The hearing continues on all week. Fraser Needham, AP10 National News, Ottawa. The Assembly of Nova Scotia Chiefs are calling for an emergency meeting with the Minister of Fisheries. They say fisheries officers left two Mi'kmaq fishers with no footwear in the middle of the night, hours from home. Angel Moore reports. About 50 people, including Mi'kmaq fishers, community leaders and supporters, gathered at the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Regional Office in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, to peacefully protest against the actions of fisheries officers. Two Mi'kmaq fishermen, Blaise Sillyboy of the Escazoni First Nation and Kevin Hartling of the Member Two First Nation, say the officers left them with no phones and no shoes in the middle of the night at a gas station in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, about 200 kilometers southeast of Halifax. Yes, we told them that we were not from the area. We were from Cape Breton, and we had no way to contact anyone without our phones. I even asked them if they could uh, supervise me. Well, I looked through my contacts on my phone so I could get a hold of someone, and they refused to do that as well. Elvers can sell for up to $5,000 a kilogram. However, last month, DFO cancelled the Elver fishery, citing a need to conserve the species and because of safety reasons. Hartling and Silly Boy say on March 26, just before midnight, they were arrested by fisheries officers for unauthorized Elver fishing. They seized their gear, including their cell phones and wading boots. I even told them, you can cut the boots and, like, just give me... Give me the sh the boots. I will I'll wear them. And he was like, uh, he was like, no. If I do that, I can't. That'll be like for invest. There'll be no investigation. I say, yeah, I, I understand. But like right now, I have no shoes, man. According to the two Mi'kmaq fishermen, fisheries officers drove them to the Irving gas station in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Silly boy was shocked. They were left wearing their socks with no footwear. Like I told, I told him, like you're really gonna leave me here with no shoes at the urban station. He said, "You know the consequences, man." He said, "That that's on your, that's your fault." And I was just like, "Man, like you, why would you leave somebody like that?" Hartley and Silly Boy say they started walking with cardboard and plastic wrapped around their feet, donated by the clerk at the gas station. It was about seven degrees Celsius with drizzle and fog. 
I couldn't wait outside the urban station. If I waited outside the urban station, I, like I could have frozen that. Like it was, it was cold out. Along the highway, the fishers say they came across a clothing bin. They helped themselves and wrapped their feet with clothes. After walking a few more hours, a car picked them up and drove them back to Shelburne. Silly Boy called for help. Hartling says the experience was terrible. People even put uh, shoes on their dogs in the wintertime for they don't get salt and shit in their pee. We didn't even have that. A statement from the Minister of Fisheries, Diane Labote's office, confirms two people were arrested and released in Shelburne County on March 26. And, we are taking the situation extremely seriously. DFO has launched an investigation into it and is also in touch with community leadership. As this matter is under an investigation, it would be inappropriate to comment further at this time. Chief Bob Glode of the Millbrook First Nation was at the protest. He said the officers' actions were unacceptable. Well, the first, first thing we were looking for is, is uh, for those individuals who are responsible to immediately be fired um, from, from DFO and be held accountable for their actions. The, the next thing we need to do is uh, continue to uh, emphasize to DFO that our, our rights supersede the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the um, the DFO regulations and rules and regulations regards on how they manage the fisheries. The Mi'kmaq fishers and supporters made their way to the location where Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was holding a press conference and made sure they were heard. Trudeau was asked how his government would be accountable. I think the first step is making sure there's a full investigation into what happened. And then, uh, as the facts are made clear, uh, there will need to be consequences and responses. Angel Moore, APTN National News, Jabuktuk, also called Halifax. Thanks, Angel. To Manitoba now, where the government unveiled the province's 2024 budget today. This marks the first budget released under NDP Premier Wab Canoe's government. Much of the budget focused on expanding the health care system. Commitments for northern communities included a new airport at Wasagamac First Nation, improving access to dialysis services in Norway House and Pimichikamak Cree Nation. The province will also dedicate $20 million to a missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and two-spirit strategy. That's in addition to the $20 million. The, to the uh, search of the Prairie Green landfill for the remains of three Indigenous women. Assembly of Manitoba Chiefs Grand Chief Kathy Merrick said she hopes to meet with the Premier to discuss the next steps. We're very pleased as to what was uh, pushed forward by the provincial government. It's not, we have to give them time. So as, uh, as the Grand Chiefs of uh, in respect to, to that process. We're very happy with uh, Wasikamak getting their airport and that's something that's a lifeline for their people. Saskatoon's only late night safe consumption site is reducing its hours next month. Beginning May 1st, Prairie Harm Reduction will only be operating until 4 p.m. Currently, the site operates from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. But due to a lack of funding and increased demand on staff, the site will be locking its doors at 4 p.m. This means there will be no safe consumption site in Saskatoon that is open in the evening. Prairie Harm Reduction's drop-in centre will also be closing at 4 p.m. The drop-in centre offers the only public washroom in the surrounding area, as well as a way for people to warm up in the winter and cool down in the summer. Uh, Executive Director of Prairie Harm Reduction, Kayla Dumong, says she feels it's the government's responsibility to step in to ensure services like theirs can keep their doors open. We know the numbers are growing, we know the lack of housing, we know the like, lack of financial support, and year after year we're seeing less and less money being put into this community. Time for a quick break. Still to come, the celebrations continue as Nunavut celebrates its 25th. Welcome back. 
This week, Nunavut's capital celebrated an important anniversary, the territory's 25th birthday. Trevor Wright has more. Monday evening, the government of Nunavut held a community celebration to celebrate the passage of the Nunavut Act on April 1, 1999. It separated Nunavut from the Northwest Territories. Performances, Inuit country food, and keynote addresses from special guests were all part of the festivities. We can take pride in how we have moved our territory forward in the last 25 years. As we know that there is still more to be done. Nunavut MP Lori Idlaut echoed that optimism, saying despite facing continued adversity, Inuit will continue to persevere. Because despite all the hardships that we're going to continue to experience, we can still have hope for our future. Nunavut Premier P.J. Akyogok said the devolution agreement signed earlier this January is a sign that the territory's future will be its own. In the past, too many decisions about us were made without us. With the signing of this historic agreement, we could now bring decision-making a lot closer to home right here in Nunavut. As part of the Nunavut's 25th anniversary celebrations, Governor General Mary Simon gave John Amaralik a medal. As earlier in the day, she promoted him from a member to an officer of the Order of Canada in a private ceremony. Amaralik is known as the father of Nunavut for leading negotiations and the implementation of the Nunavut Land Claims Agreement. The impact of his contributions extend well beyond Nunavut. He helped shape our federation. John is a Canadian hero. Trevor Wright, APTN National News, Hikaluit. Last month, the British Columbia government announced an update on the Haida Nation's title agreement. It would officially recognize the Haida's title over the islands of Haida Gwaii. The BC United is currently the provincial opposition party and it released a statement First Nations leaders found concerning. Robert Phillips is a political executive from the First Nations Leadership Council. He joins us now. Mr. Phillips, thanks for being with us. Uh, can you tell us the Leadership Council's concerns with the BC United Party statement? Well, I think with the BC United Party, um, I, I don't really want that to be the focus. The focus should be on what's really happening here, which is after 50 years of negotiations, court battles, protests on the ground, this should be celebrated that uh, Haida title is finally recognized on Haida Gwaii. And, you know, with the rising tide, Haida title land agreement officially recognized and affirmed uh, the nation's um, rights and title over Haida Gwaii under Section 35, which, you know, I think it's historical. And, um, you know, when we hear politicians uh, fear-mongering, uh, spreading misinformation, um, agreeing to something like when they signed off on the UN Declaration and, and the Declaration Rights uh, uh, in British Columbia, and then now when the, the process and the action plan and uh, the agreements start happening, you know, they're running down the hallway with their hair on fire. And, um, you know, I do know that, you know, I think this is a time and place. You know, we're in the 21st century uh, in Canada and British Columbia over 150 years and 450 years of colonization. We know the history and we need to get to this point where, you know, no more court cases, no more protests. We need to set up a process. We need to negotiate. And uh, when we have uh, these agreements, such as the Haida Gwaii Agreement, you know, I think it really gives the details of uh, setting up a process so that we don't have to be fighting and battling all the time. But then we hear parties uh, such as the BC United Party and the leader, you know, wanting to go back to the days where there were conflict. And uh, I think this is something that uh, when it comes to the opposition, uh, BC United Party, whether it's the leader 
Kevin Falcon or Michael Lee, who I talked to quite a bit. So I was very surprised when he's the shadow minister for the and the, for the Indigenous Relations and the Attorney General, when they come out and, and say such things that it's an infringement on landowners and of Crown land, when uh, we know that this is setting up a process crown title right up to the supreme court of canada there's one court case after another uh that that talks about you know our aboriginal title on the land uh, it's been here for thousands of years and uh now uh in the last uh number of hundred years there is this new crown title that's conflicting but aboriginal title has always been here can you talk about, I guess, the importance of all British Columbians seeing the value of the Haida Title Agreement? Well, I think when we look at it, uh, especially from the perspective of uh, where we have to go, uh, it has to look at reconciliation. We need agreements. I'm with the First Nation Summit in British Columbia. And, um, you know, I know that uh, we have treaties, agreements, and other constructive arrangements. And... Um, this is a very important agreement. The Haida, as I mentioned, have been negotiating this for 50 years. Uh, they've had for thousands of years a governing body. Uh, now is the time for Canadians and British Columbians to understand that uh, agreements have to happen. A process has to be set up. And uh, in order for there to be land management, uh, co-management, um, we're talking in a lot of areas. And so when we hear... Uh, fear-mongering that this is taken away from uh, landowners. It's not. The land rights are still there. There's still fee simple in Haida Gwaii. There's still health care. There's still education. There is so many services that are there, and this will not be impacted. And, um, you know, these parties, uh, opposition parties, whether conservatives of British Columbia or the BC United, they should be more concerned about uh, actually, the funding that's there for getting doctors, for getting hospitals, for more education, not worrying about where there's capacity building happening in rural British Columbia and isolated communities and uh, throughout British Columbia. Because I do believe if Indigenous people, First Nations people are prosperous, that will mean prosperity for First Nations, not only in those regions, but for all Canadians and all British Columbians. So, you know, that's a story that uh, needs to be told. And I think that uh, when it comes to uh, this fear mongering, when it comes to the spreading of misinformation, it has to stop. It, it gets people excited. Uh, it impacts Indigenous people in our schools, young kids, prejudice, racism. And it just spreads misinformation, and this is this shouldn't happen. It has to stop. Mr. Phillips, we'll have to leave it there, but appreciate you taking some time for us to talk about this. Okay, appreciate it. Thank you. Time to step aside for one last break. Still to come, some youth in Saskatchewan are getting a first-hand look at a career in fire services. Stick around. Welcome back. Time now for our photo of the day. This Easter Sunday, Sandra Seidel had a few turkeys over for dinner. And then these birds showed up in her front yard. Sandra cooks so well, they had to stop by and say hello. Word is they only cooked up the biggest one. To be our next photo of the day, you can send your photos now to share at aptn.ca. Now let's take a look at tomorrow's weather forecast. Starting on the East Coast, showers at 5 in Halifax, 9 above in Fredericton. Minus 1 with flurries in Kudouac, 2 and snow in Nain. Cloudy and 8 for Montreal, 6 in Val d'Or. 4 with snow in Sault Ste. Marie, plus 2 in flurries in North Bay. A cloudy high of 2 in Thunder Bay, sun's out and 5 in Sioux Lookout. 5 for God's Lake, cloudy and 7 in Norway House. 9 for Winnipeg, 11 in Dauphin, 17 above in Regina, 18 for Saskatoon, 15 in Meadow Lake, 12 with showers in La Ronge. Over in Northern Alberta, showers in 9 for Grand Prairie, Peace River and Fort McMurray, 9 with rain in Edmonton, showers in 17 in Lethbridge, 10 with rain in Vancouver, cloudy in 11 in Kamloops. Five for Prince George, seven above in Smithers. 
Minus four in Old Crow, plus five for White Horse. Four below in Yellowknife, Snow in minus five in Norman Wells. Minus 18 in Saks Harbor, 14 below for Politak. Minus nine and Snow for Chesterfield and Whale Cove. Minus 14 in Resolute, Snow and minus nine in Joe Haven. The British Columbia Arts Council has their first elder in residence. They say it's a huge step forward to learning and promoting Indigenous knowledge in the province's arts community. Roy Henry Vickers is the new elder in residence. He's a renowned Simshian Haida and Hailsuck artist who previously served as an arts council member. The elder in residence role will help recognize Indigenous perspectives and guide council activities. Vickers will also support community projects and mentor, mentor other artists. This year, the province plans to spend nearly $40 million through the Arts Council. Female Indigenous youth in Prince Albert are getting a chance to experience what it would be like to take on a career in fire services. Our reporter, Rachel May, has more. People still think that this is a career that's not a viable option for young women. Founder of Camp Molly and the fire chief for the city of Kingston, Ontario, Monique Belair, says all female Indigenous youth are being invited to apply to attend Camp Molly, named after the first recognized female firefighter, Molly Williams. The camp offers young women between 15 and 18 the chance to experience firsthand how a career in fire service looks. Belair says it's important that Indigenous youth are able to come out and learn about fire services in their communities. We don't have that connection um, with a lot of the reserve fire services because they don't fall under the same legislation that we do. With strong female leadership kept in mind, Bel Air named the camp after Molly Williams, who according to historical record became the first known female firefighter in 1818 in the United States. Bel Air has been in fire services for 38 years herself and says it's important for women to have role models in the field. Natasha Carter is the director of social media for Camp Molly. Carter says she's happy to see Indigenous youth learn skills they can use at home. Fire safety and fire prevention begins at home. Um, teach them some real skills that they can take back to their communities. The camp will include education on issues rural communities might face, such as wildfires. Registration closes April 13th, with the camp taking place June 13th to 16th in Prince Albert. Rachel May, ABTN National News, Saskatoon. Some good looking training there. And that's all the time we have for your APTN National News for this Tuesday. For news anytime, you can visit our website, aptnnews.ca. That's where you'll find much more on the stories you've seen here tonight. I'm Dennis Ward, Marcy Miigwich. Thanks for being with us. Stick around. An encore presentation of Face to Face is up next. Our guest tonight is 60 Scoop Survivor and Chief of the Broken Head Ojibwe Nation, Gordon Blueskai. Have a great night.